Thank you, Professor Holm. Not a Good. professor. <laughs> Dr. Holm. It's a sign of that? revering. <laughs> Um, it's already 2 p.m. Good afternoon, everybody. And just before I walked in here, I thought I heard somebody close to where I sat yawning. He seemed tired. <laughs> just a lot of lectures going on. I'm not going to look at anybody, but so, so I wouldn't be misunderstood. But I realize a lot of you have had lunch by now, and a lot of you have been sitting through endless lectures. So I hope I'll make mine a little bit light and a little bit entertaining. And not only that, basically, I sat in the... Just before I came here, I gave the other half of it in the other lecture room, which is more like a theater because just more, I felt like Laurence Olivier giving out some performance of a lifetime, but this is a little bit more modern. So let me get on with it and tell you. My name is Rami Adwan, as Dr. Holm introduced, and I come from Jordan. To a lot of you who may not know Jordan, this is a country in the Middle East. It sits between Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. So if you look at it, we're sitting between that part of the world that has suffered so much, but we have managed to remain in neutral and stable, which gave us a lot of time to focus on our, you know, improvements and advancements as a country. But in the spirit of this discourse and everything that is introduced here about innovation, entrepreneurship, and addressing the demographic changes, I will start by introducing one piece of data. Jordan has had more than its fair share of demographic change. Over the past year, Jordan's population increased from 7 million to about 10 million, or 7.5 to 11 million. And this was the result of the influx of about 3 to 4 million immigrants from various parts in the Middle East as a result of the ongoing wars. So when we look at the challenges that we face globally, increasing population and they are also living a lot more than before so you know people are not just dying at 70 or 60 as they used to be in the past they are aging and in addition to aging they are growing a lot of illnesses so they are aging with a lot of need for health care and a lot of need for care in general in addition we are no longer as rich as we used to be in the past we have economic constraints, natural resources constraints, so we can't afford to give everybody a convertible car, and we can't afford to give everybody endless pensions, and, 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 and. We just have to be a little bit smarter. And in Jordan, and specific to the healthcare sector, the challenges sort of mirror from the macro picture to the smaller picture. So what do we have in the healthcare sector? We have crowded facilities. Okay, we have about 45 hospitals in Jordan about 85 primary or comprehensive clinics, and some 400 primary clinics. Now, you would think the number is pretty okay. I mean, I'm not gonna get into the medical metrics and the public health metrics, but the number seems okay, but they are crowded. And that means people come and they have to wait a lot of time. In addition, they do not have any systems. Most of them are still using the paper-based operation. You go to a hospital, a doctor sees you, he writes your memo in a, in a card or a medication card or a history card, and this card goes into the filing room. And the next time you visit, they write another one. It goes next to the old one and next to the old one. And nobody checks the old one and nobody checks the one before it. And what does that mean? It means that this is all a waste of paper, a waste of time. The doctor needed not to write anything because they're not using it anyway. And also because we have very poor integration with the money cycle in the hospital. Um, for the patients who are insured with the civil insurance, i.e. the civil servants, when they go to a hospital, they have to do about 11 stops before they see the doctor and get their medication. They register, they go and pay, they go and take an appointment, they go to see the doctor, then they go to the pharmacy and ask how much the medications are worth, then they go to the cashier to pay for the price of the medication or their deductible part, and then they go to the pharmacy, and if the pharmacy says they are expired, they have to go back to the doctor and says they don't have it in stock, write something else for me, and so on, and it is an atrocious cycle. It's a horrible cycle. You don't want to be there. Sometimes it's a lot easier to just go to a private hospital and pay from your own pocket than to receive insurance because of the suffering that people go through. But this is reality, it does exist. 
And this poor patient experience is the result of very poorly integrated services as well. If you go from one hospital to another, you need to carry with you a lot of paper or be re-examined from the beginning, and this is also not good. In addition, that results in lack of continuity of care. What is continuity of care? Basically, if you have a medical condition and you are being treated for it and you go to another doctor, let me give you a very simple example. If you have a situation that requires that you take a blood coagulants, anticoagulants, like aspirin or heparins or so on, and you go to the dentist, a normal dentist will not normally ask you if you are taking any of these medications. And a small procedure could become dangerous because you could bleed endlessly. And that is what would happen. But because we don't have this automated system, these problems do occur. And in the end, we just have very um, manual and late statistics. We get one report every year and around October for the year before that tells us, okay, we have that many females, that many males between the age of this and that, and they have X, Y, Z illnesses and so on. Good. So what if we want more granularity? We don't get that. Hence, the need for our program that we are implementing in Jordan, it's called Hakim. Hakim in Arabic stands for the wise man or the doctor. I mean, in the past, when you went to the villages, the doctor was the wise man. He was always the wise man. He knew everything, and he could just treat everything. And Today, I mean, you know, they know about medicine, but sometimes we don't trust them that much, but that's okay. It's another story. So it was a need to create a program that responded to the need to improve the administration of these facilities and make life a lot easier for the patients. And Hakim program basically is a government, partly government-owned program that has a concession to implement a national IT network of electronic health records. So whether you are in the north or the south, in a hospital in the east or a clinic in the west, it is the same IT database with evidence-based medicine, i.e. not what everybody wants. They can't just get a programmer who can decide what to program. It is driven by doctors for the purpose of medicine. And this ensures that we get the benefits of everything against the challenges on the ground. What is the objective? We probably touched briefly on that. But before I get into this, let me tell you. I mean, we basically go to every hospital and every primary clinic and every comprehensive clinic. Those are the larger clinics without inpatients. And we start from registering the patient to having the medical history, to the notes from the surgery, to the emergency, to their medication profiles, lab profiles, and the radiology images, all on one system, tied to a patient by the national ID. So all you need is your national ID number, and when you have that, you have the entire medical record. Of course, it's secure. Access is limited to doctors or nurses or residents or administrators, each to his own level of authority, in line with the, how the system has been designed, and it works. So far, we have it in about 50 sites in Jordan, and by the end of next year, and we say in Arabic, inshallah, you know, may God will, we will have it in another 50 sites, making a total of 100, so basically by the year 2018, we will have it across the entire kingdom. And this will give us the ability to improve diagnosis because we are building on cumulative knowledge. It will give us the ability to improve the patient experience. They do not need to stop 11 stops. They can just do it in three right now. It's quickly. Am I losing time or I'm fine? No, you are perfect. Fine, okay. Um, reducing operating costs. Um, before I actually came here, I was in the other, um, the hall, basically, the one with the theater, and uh, Dr. Karsten actually made a little introduction about a unique selling point. He was introducing it to the students who attended there, telling them that as you build your innovation or your idea, think how you want to sell it to people. What value is it giving to them? And as a program that costs the government a lot of money, we always have to, sit to think about unique selling points. Why should the government continue to invest in the system? And while we speak about healthcare benefits and demographic challenges, the Minister of Finance, i.e. the money, the checkbook, the purse, whatever you want to call them, he likes to hear about the reduction of operating expenses. How much money are we going to save the country by investing in this program? 
And we tell them usually, as we have validated with studies, that by doing this program, we save about 25 to 30% of the cost of medication paid annually to patients. This is about $150 million annually. 25 to 30% would be around 40 to $50 million per year, which pays for more than the program. It actually pays a lot more or saves the government a lot more than paying for the program. They like the story, they buy it, and they have been funding the program ever since. So basically, I added this little map to show you how beautiful Jordan is, but I don't know if the black and white silhouette there would actually tell you. Well, I don't have the laser pointer, or I do. Well, basically from the north where we have all the Syrian refugees coming, to the east where we have all the Iraqi refugees coming, to the Saudis in the south who fund our government every now and then, and to Palestine and Israel where we just have to play a wise man and mediating all the time between the two parties. So this is basically Jordan. And by the year 2018, we will have about 45 hospitals completely automated, 85 comprehensive clinics, 400 plus primary clinics, all automated and connected onto the network. Now you will ask yourself, like, okay, he's come from Jordan to tell us about putting computer systems and software in hospitals. We have that in every hospital in Germany. So why is he telling us this? Well, let me tell you, no, you don't. Very simple. And you have levels of automation and the experience in Jordan in the absolute sense is far ahead of anywhere else that you will find in Europe, except maybe small pockets. To have one entire country is an advantage that Holm mentioned a little while back. You can actually skip laying down the wire to move to the wireless. We have not automated sporadically from the beginning, so we can afford to do the national ambitious program a lot more cost effectively for Jordan. And that means that the benefits of having one record per patient across the country is tremendous. This is what it is. It does not exist anywhere in Europe, and in Germany you have the sickness funds that actually pay for the hospitals for treatment. And I'm aware because I'm discussing with a German company here, uh, a consulting firm that will help us a little bit in using the data for analytics, that they face a lot of challenges in the duplication or the access to files and, 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 and endless amounts of challenges. But okay, we've got all these systems in place, so what's the use? Okay, we've got endless amounts of data. I'll give you a little example. Um, look at your notebooks. Each one of you is actually writing a little bit of this and that, a note here, a note there, copying a memo from up here. How often do you actually look back in your book? I have a notebook that I use in my company whenever I sit in meetings and I keep writing. It gives people the impression I'm going to follow up. I don't always follow up, <laughs> actually. I have them all stacked from 1999 until now they're in the storeroom gathering dust. I just wonder if there is an action item I missed in 2005 that I need to go back to, but who cares? <laughs> so the point is with people's health, you cannot afford to do that. I can afford to miss out on an appointment since 2005, but you cannot play with people's health. And if you look at Jordan and the demographic challenge, in 1961, we lived on average 54 years, beautiful years, the 60s and you know, all that. I didn't live that time, so, but we have to pretend they were beautiful. They were black and white anyway. And then in 2012, we are now living about 74 years of age. And from that 74 years of age, only 3% of us are actually above 65 years of age. We are not an old population. 37 are just under 15. So I have a lot of children. But anyway, in 2020, and actually 2025, we're expected to go to about 7%. This means that in about 10 years from now, the aging, the elderly population that is using the healthcare system will be double what it is today. That's a disaster. Because we know we don't have the money to make new hospitals and new clinics and recruit new doctors and so on. The only challenge is really to make it more effective and more efficient. That is what it is. And here you enter into better administration and preventive personalized medicine so that you can actually move away from having to administer medicine in the standard way that we are all doing it to something more preventive and more proactive. I'm going to give you these three pie charts and I want to qualify them before somebody looks on the internet and says I gave wrong data. 
Okay? The amount or, or the number of, let me put it, the highest causes of death in Jordan are basically the NCDs, and I'm not factoring in cancers. NCDs are non-communicable diseases, i.e. illnesses that you do not contract by infection. You do not get them by bacteria or virus, like cancer, like diabetes, like hypertension. You get them because you probably have a family history in that, okay? So 49% of the deaths in Jordan are caused by this. It's a little bit less in Germany and a lot less in America, 33%. Well, that they have a higher Alzheimer's rate. So that sort of figures out the pie. They forget a lot more than we do. But that's another story. Okay? So what does that mean? When you have those illnesses, you have to just continue giving the medication all throughout the life. And not only that, if the patient decides they forget to take the medication or they stop taking the medication, the risk of strokes and non-lethal strokes i.e. they do not die, they just become a little bit brain damaged or, you know, physiologically damaged, requiring more care from a nurse or an in-house care or whatever, becomes very high, which means the cost on the economy becomes high. So we have to find ways of actually making this a lot more cost effective. This is the raison d'etre of our program. It is about moving from traditional health to more intelligent health. By having this national network, we will be able to collect all this data. We will be able to look at all sorts of patterns that can improve the healthcare in Jordan. We can look at hospital administration. You know, our doctors in Jordan complain a lot that they are overworked. I go to public sector hospitals, I find them around 1 p.m. empty. And they keep saying, we see a lot of patients so well. You continue to work until four. They cramp the patients in a couple of hours of the day and then they run to their private clinics. Abuse. With data, you can fight that. Patient usage patterns. We have so many patients who duplicate treatment. I go to a doctor and I don't like what he says. I go to a second one and he does another x-ray for me or another MRI for me. And then I get the medication and you know what? Uh, this is an expensive medication. I'll go to another clinic and get the same medication again, and then I'll go to a private pharmacy and it's replaced it with shampoo or shaving blades. And this abuse happens because not all the pharmacies are automated. And some of that, that does not happen out of bad will. It happens because they are afraid that the medicine will expire or they will not have it in stock at the public sector pharmacy, so they mass it a lot and they bring it to their homes. Doctor usage patterns, how many doctors, how many patients is a doctor seeing? How many medications are they prescribing? And so on. Drug efficiency and dispensation patterns, um, cost optimization patterns, public health standards and pr predictive medicine. It is at this point that I want to leave you with this thought. When I was at university, you know, not, not, not that long back, but it was a little bit behind, the words innovation and entrepreneurship were not that common. When we refer to innovation, innovation was something that you would find in labs. It is something that you will find in the uh, academia or the labs of multinational companies. It was not a mainstream everyday term that we used, okay? Today it is. Everybody speaks about innovation, boundless innovation. You can innovate while you are at home. Okay, I mean, if you sit in the chair just staring out from your window, you maybe get that killer idea that will transform the universe. It's not likely, but you can do it outside a lab. And entrepreneurship was not something that everybody spoke about. The traditional mindset when I was at university is I want to graduate to get a job, not to start my own business. Today, every Tom, Dick, and Harry wants to start their own business, and you have E this, E that, E idea, E give me money dot com, E I don't know, whatever, you name it, you know? But the point is, away from all this trivialization, the truth is, never has the world been so ready to support people with ideas and accept eccentricity and out of the box. So I, I want to leave you with the thought that we are all in the private sector, even the nonprofit companies like myself, are ready to support innovation whenever it comes. Dr. Holm, you mentioned about, I'm not using professor. Dr. Holm, you mentioned about at the end, somebody may win a trip to Jordan. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that 
whether with those people or with additional people, our program is open to receive any number of trainees. Well, not all of you together at the same time. <laughs> That'll be just a little bit of an overkill. But we are happy to cooperate and extend the opportunity for anybody who wants to come and try things out and experience and gain access to a trying pod or a launch pod or whatever it is in Jordan. We have a very mature uh, company. We have a very mature entrepreneurial landscape in Jordan that completes the full ecosystem. So feel free to come and explore and try. On this note, I want to thank you all for being such a great audience, and it has been my pleasure to address you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.